2021, a year that, in spite of the world, managed to still be a hell of a thing for tokusatsu nerds thanks to a triple decker of anniversaries. Ultraman's 55th, Kamen Rider's 50th, and Super Sentai's 45th anniversary. As you'd expect, all three franchises opened the floodgates for new project announcements and special TV shows to celebrate the festivities. And that was all great. But for the first time in a while, personally, I wasn't all that thrilled by the offerings from the big three. Zenkaiju, for instance, it was an enjoyable TV show, and I mean, I do like it still, but there were times I often found myself tuning out because of how slapdash the whole thing felt. Kamen Rider Revice, all controversy aside, really didn't do anything to impress me. And Ultraman Trigger, well, did that. Whereas usually this would motivate me to go back and watch things that I hadn't already seen yet, or even revisiting a couple of old favorites, 2021 offered a very unique solution to the problem. A slew of shows outside of the big three that were absolutely amazing. And with this channel being partially about spreading the word about new and exciting tokusatsu projects off the beaten path, I felt the need to mark this occasion by rambling about them incessantly. Consider this then a personal shortlist of the past year, with a handy playlist at the end of the episode to help you track things down. So without further ado, for Vintage Tension Extra, I am Mike Dent, and this is our 2021 Tuxatsu Viewing Guide. So let's kick things off by focusing on a couple of shows that aired on major networks. These will include things that are both uh, tokusatsu and tokusatsu adjacent. But I'm going to start this off with the show that, as far as I'm concerned, is easily a contender for show of the year. <laughs> Coming out of nowhere and vanishing just as quickly was high-speed parahero Gundeen. No pun intended on that one. The show only ran three episodes on NHK. Even with the reduced episode length, it didn't stop the show from being one of the best projects of the year. The visual effects alone were just stellar, being a mix of analog and digital tokusatsu in a way reminiscent of most new generation Ultraman shows. Apart from the effects, the thing that is really commendable for me was the story, which goes into territory that we haven't really seen for a henshin hero project, focusing on a protagonist who is disabled. Gundine actually handles this aspect a lot more respectfully than you would imagine, adding a bit of depth and tension as our lead struggles with this new power to save the world, but also wondering if he himself is strong enough to do it. My only real gripe with Gundine, though, is that its final episode spends a lot of time setting up for a potential follow-up. As of right now, we still have not heard any word if something is going to be happening, so I really do hope we see more Gundeen, because I would hate to see all that setup just go to waste. Following Gundeen, we have a show that is basically Akiba Ranger, but with the dial turned down five notches, set in high school and starring members of Johnny's Junior, the trainee branch of Johnny and Associates. That's the rough foundation for the High School Heroes, a Toei and J-Storm co-production done as a kind of bonus anniversary celebration for the Super Sentai series. On the whole, it's pretty fun, with all sorts of nods to Go Ranger of all things by way of Taisei, or Akihiro, the team leader who is a tremendous Sentai nerd. And while the story does find itself bogged down at times with the checklist of high school J-drama cliches, some bizarre mood whiplash, and an ending that just sort of happens, it doesn't dampen anything or ruin the experience. That said, the strongest moment of the High School Heroes, and the reason that a majority of the internet was talking about it, was its inclusion of the first ever openly trans Pink Ranger with Mobo Hero. It isn't played for laughs, and it contributes to a really awesome moral for the episode, which is basically, screw the status quo and be true to yourself. As much as I would not mind seeing a follow-up to this series, I also know in my heart of hearts that it may never happen and I shouldn't get my hopes up. Because Johnny's. Need I say more? Moving on from that, uh, over the last few years, NHK has given us a plethora of tokusatsu documentaries, some of them even fully subtitled or dubbed into English for NHK World. 
In 2021, we got one as part of an ongoing educational variety show starring Takashiki Tano. The show, This Is Beat Takashi's History of Japanese Entertainment, gave us a full episode devoted to the history of Japanese special effects. But this wasn't just your standard romp that focused on the big three and kind of called it a day. Because in addition to focusing on that, we got sections devoted to some of the earliest Japanese special effects films, a portion devoted to the late and great Pete productions, tutorials about how to do your own effects at home, and even added commentary from Ultraman Dinah's Takashi Saruno, who also appeared in Gundin, as well as Atsuko Takahata, who played Maribaran in Kamen Rider Black RX. This is Beat Takashi's History of Japanese Entertainment sadly has yet to be made available on NHK World On Demand, but with a little bit of uh, <clears throat> archaeology, you might be able to get your hands on them. Oh my god, what's that? Anyway, to round out this section is a series that kind of blew me away when I saw it up here on my Netflix queue, as I hadn't heard any of the news leading up to it. Japan Sinks, People of Hope. This is the fifth adaptation of Sakio Komatsu's classic science fiction novel. Even crazier that this came just one year after the last adaptation released on Netflix, Japan Sinks 2020. If you've seen the movie or read the novel, the story is relatively the same, with the Japanese archipelago in danger of total submersion due to catastrophic seismic events. But whereas 2020 focused more on the ordinary people in the heart of the crisis, People of Hope decided to ground the situation and focus more on the politics. Because of that shifted focus, there were people describing the series as Shin Godzilla Light, and I can't blame them for that, as there's no denying the influence, where Shin Godzilla was a touch more satirical and allegorical with its commentary, People of Hope go straight into things. Characters flat out allude to and even directly reference things like the Japanese response to the 311 disaster, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. And while things do get a touch over the top, it never throws out the suspension of disbelief. A large part of that is the amazing ensemble cast who knocked it out of the park with their performances every damn episode. Kinai Tokusatsu fans may even spot a few familiar faces including Shun Oguri, who, in addition to projects like the live-action Gintama in Crow Zero, also appeared recently in Godzilla vs. Kong as Dr. Serizawa's son. In regards to the visual effects, while we don't get anything on par with the 2006 film adaptation directed by Shinji Higuchi, what little scenes we do get in People of Hope are pretty well done. But diehard fans of both the 2006 and original 1973 films may still be left unsatisfied in this department. Japan Sinks People of Hope is still currently available on Netflix in its entirety, and I honestly may have to come back to this one someday. I want to stack it against the other adaptations of Japan Sinks and see how they all hold up. Stay tuned for further details on that one. And since we're talking about Netflix before anyone says anything, just Godzilla singular point. I don't know what I can say about it that would be relatively groundbreaking, because everything else has been said about it. Just... Go watch it. Watch the monstrosities tokusatsu vlog behind the scenes content. Just do it. Now the indies. <laughs> we now enter the realm of 2021's indie tokusatsu shows, both broadcast on television and online. And surprisingly enough, we got a lot of things in this category this year. Hojin Yasurugi made it to its 10th season. Ninja Repu managed to round out its 7th season. Triple Wing came out and had the catchiest theme song of the year. <laughs> To see a mashup of my favorite indies from last year, check out the Year in Indies 2021 showcase via the card in the top right. But in the meantime, I have three absolute gems worth tracking down. The Gengers, one of the biggest local hero crossover projects, was a runaway hit when it premiered in 2020. So much that they managed a successful crowdfunding campaign for suit repairs and a second season. And thus, in 2021, we got Dogenger's Nice Buddy, a show that could have just easily been more of the same, but decided to instead double down on what made everyone fall in love in the first place. And I hate to say it, it's the show Zenkaiger could have been if they were willing to give the story and characters a bit more substance. I say this because Nice Buddy has equal amounts of chaos happening, but the character arcs carry more weight, and the story feels like a proper love letter to both fans, as well as anyone who's loved or ever wanted to be a local hero. I'm also slightly biased towards Nice Buddy because it was a season that was basically made for me, right down to the giant robots in one of the most hilarious mods to Seibu Keisatsu ever. 
Either way, the team obviously did something right because sure enough, as of this video, the third season, Dogenger's High School, is on the verge of release. And dear lord, I cannot wait to see what my favorite team of hot mess superheroes will get up to this time. Now, we've gushed about Tochiangar 7 on Vintage Henshin before, a project born from a man who literally said, why not both, and made a pitch-perfect ode to peak Henshin Boom era superheroes while also promoting his operage business. After a successful crowdfunded feature film in 2019, 2021 saw another campaign in production of a second season of episodes. This time around, the story jumps ahead several years and features members of the idol group NGT48 as the show's equivalent of Rider Girls. The absolute standout amongst them, in my opinion, is Nanami Otsuka, who plays newcomer Mari Kazami, a mashup of Peggy from Go Ranger and Annie from Space Sheriff Shider. It does not get any better than that. Now, the one downer of Tochi Younger 7 Season 2 is that it feels like it was itching to do more, which tracks as unfortunately the production team only reached 50% of their original crowdfunding goal. But instead of attempting the same epic scale of Season 1 regardless, Season 2 worked within its limits, played to its strengths, and opted for a more intimate dramatic story arc. It made for a much stronger finale and a definite step up that led me eager to see where the staff can go from here. And now, the show that I was dragged into watching kicking and screaming. Hit it. Safety First, Daichi Man 2 is the second TV series focused on Okinawan-based local hero Daichi Man, the mascot of Daichi Construction, which sponsors the show, and in series is the location of our hero's secret base of operations. Daichi Man works with the mysterious Third Sales Department, using his power suit to fight land sailors, humans possessed by vengeful gods who are furious over recent construction and land development projects in the region. In addition to the incredibly infectious opening theme and the main cast who were just that damn charming, what kept me coming back to Daichi Man and Daichi Man 2 were the well-executed action sequences and effects. You can tell they are working with a limited budget, largely with how the fights are just a little too short. But much like Tochi Younger 7, they also work within their means, making the big moments of each battle, and no pun intended, hit hard. As of this video, the team behind Daichi Man is currently gearing up for Okinawa Heroes, a massive crossover event featuring several other well-known local heroes from the prefecture. In the meantime, select episodes of Daichi Man and Daichi Man 2 are available for viewing on YouTube, and I recommend checking them out. Also, sorry not sorry in advance for getting the theme song stuck in your head for the next two weeks. Well, that closes out our first ever viewing guide. Hopefully I can make this more of a tradition. While 2022 is looking a bit more optimistic for projects, I'm kind of hoping we get more things off the beaten path again. Because it was honestly far more fun to find out about all these exciting things instead of just waiting for the big three to course correct. At the same time, my desire stems from the way the world is right now, which is why I'm rooting for all those out there who are working to create these new stories in spite of it. Best of luck, and we'll see you here next year.